Okay, so we're at time. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I tend to talk fast, so if I start rambling a lot, throw paper at me or something, and I promise I'll slow down. Also, I realize this is the last day of the conference, the session right before lunch. We're here for an hour and a half, so I'm gonna try to make this as engaging as possible to make sure that we all stay awake. So first engaging question, who here has heard about passkeys? Awesome, it's almost everybody. Who here has actually used passkeys in their TikTok, their Uber, PayPal? Awesome, really good to hear. That's uh, pretty good numbers, pretty good for adoption. Um, so that's essentially what we're here to talk about today. Um, passkeys to the people, really understanding how to build a full end-to-end -end passkey application uh, using open source technologies. Now, the reason this is important is because a lot of these passkey functionalities come out of the box with some of the major identity providers, your intras, your um, Cognitos, your um, Octas, and things like that. But what we want to do is try to find a way to democratize the use of passkeys within any IDP, especially those of you who are building custom IDPs uh, for your own enterprises. Um, so we're going to be looking at this from the perspective of both consumer and enterprise use case. But overall, the goal of Ubico, where I'm from, is to just get everybody to adopt passkeys in order to facilitate a more secure web for everybody, which is our ultimate goal. So I'm gonna flip this on the head of most of these other like tutorial type sessions I've gone to. I see most of you have your laptops out, which is really good. Um, if you wanna follow along, uh, great. And if not, um, that's cool too, because I'll show you everything here on the screen. Um, our application takes a few minutes to download and deploy. Uh, so if you wanna follow along, um, we'll go through those steps first, just to make sure everything is present on your environment. And then we'll actually go into the meat of the actual uh, topic at hand. Um, so let's go ahead and try to deploy a sample application. Uh, so before I spend a few minutes on here, uh, show of hands, who's actually going to download the application? <laughs> All right, I'll give you a minute uh, if you want to like, copy the URL. Uh, it does require Docker um, to get everything up and running. Um, if you get a too many requests error, um, that's because I'm using <laughs> ECR. Um, so <laughs> uh, you may have to run it again. Um, Try to make, it's funny, when we, we do this at other conferences, sometimes this takes a lot longer to do because you try to pull the GitHub repository, build the images, and that just was not working. So I'm hoping this is a little quicker. Um, so thumbs up, thumbs down, good to go. All right, I'm just gonna assume we're good to go. Like I said, I'll go through everything here um, once we get to those specific sections. Um, now, it was really nice to see most of you raise your hand when I asked what are passkeys, uh, but I'm still going to dive into it um, to help you understand what things are from a technical perspective. And if you're going to take anything away from this presentation, it's going to be this slide right here. Um, and as always, the slides are available um, on the session notes. Passkeys, what are they? They are a replacement for passwords. If you're going to take anything away from the taking away anything slide, that's what it is. Passkeys are a replacement for passwords they're phishing resistant, and they're a discoverable FIDO2 credential. Now, some of that might sound like gibberish to you, um, and we'll go over those in just a moment. Um, but again, what's important are the fact that they're a replacement for passwords and that they're phishing resistant. Um, and why that's important is because traditional 2FA solutions, so your OTPs that you get from text messages or emails, can be retrieved. If someone performs a SIM swap attack on you, somebody compromises your email account, they're going to get into your account because they will have your password and they will have access to your OTP codes. And what passkeys guarantee is that that's not going to happen because everything is based on the um, authenticator that you're using, which we'll get to in a moment. Passkeys, they are also supported by the FIDO2 standard and the WebAuthn and CTAP specification. Again, more gibberish. I promise I'll go into that in just a moment, really just a summary slide. Um, but why now? Why is it important that we're beginning to adopt passkeys now? Why didn't we try to make people's user accounts safe one year, two years, three years, ten years ago? And this is mostly due to the um, ubiquitous FIDO2 capable devices. Uh, so from Ubico, where I'm from, we have these security keys. These have been capable of generating passkeys for a very long time. Uh, but now within your mobile devices, within your laptop, so Mac OS, Windows Hello, Touch ID, Face ID, all of those really good things, all include uh, the ability to generate a FIDO2 credential. So now that it's widely available from most of the consumer markets, um, we see this as now the time for people to start adopting these things. And again, like the show of hands at the beginning of the presentation, um, some of you have already started adopting this um, within your own accounts, which is really good to hear. 
Um, so let's dive into some of these points in a little bit more detail. Uh, passwords versus passkeys. Um, I don't think I have to convince you all why passwords are terrible. Uh, they're really just a string of characters. It's a single factor, which is something you know. And a password can be reused across multiple sites and services, which is really how you get pwned out with your user accounts. Uh, if your Netflix password is 1234 and your Facebook password is 1234, if one of those passwords leaks, somebody has access to both of your accounts now. Um, and then again, like I talked about the challenges with uh, traditional two-factor authentication. Um, it works well, it protects user accounts, but again, there still is a point of failure with most of those things. Again, being the fact that if somebody compromises any of those other accounts or your mobile devices, they will get into your, um, into your accounts. So pass keys, really big paradigm shift. So the first thing is that we're moving away from a string of characters to a cryptographic key pair. Um, most of us are probably Linux people, so you all probably know what that is, but I promise I'll go into that in a little bit more detail to help you understand how this works. Passkeys are also multiple factors, uh, and this really is based across the something you have. Again, this is your authenticator, your security key, your mobile device, your laptop, things like that, uh, paired with two additional things. And this could either be a something you know, so a PIN, very similar to your credit card um, that you would use at an ATM machine, or it's something you are. So in the case of like a Windows Hello or a Face ID, Touch ID, it's your actual biometrics. So these combined include um, the multiple factors that you need in one authenticator. And that really is one of the really powerful things about passkeys is the fact that they're a way to further secure your user accounts while also being less friction than other forms of authentication, which is a huge plus because usually more secure things add more friction and that's just not ideal. And then last but not least, um, also adding to the phishing resistant aspect of things, uh, passkeys are origin bound and unique to each service. So because your authenticator um, is generating these cryptographic key pairs, they can do this almost infinitely. Your passwords, again, you reuse them across sites. If one gets compromised, you're out of luck. Uh, but in the case of passkeys, because they are origin bound, they can only be used for a specific web service, um, which is super powerful. So cryptographic key pairs, um, if you know anything about cryptography, you've seen the Alice and Bob example, um, and I'm gonna go through it super quickly. Um, Alice wants to send, um, Alice wants Bob to send her a message, um, so Alice generates a key pair. She will hold on to the private key and send the public key to Bob. Bob will type up his message, encrypt it with the public key, and sends that encrypted message back to Alice, who will decrypt the message with the private key. Now, this, how this is uh, applicable to uh, passkeys, WebAuthn, FIDO2, is essentially uh, swapping out the actors for the authenticator and the actual application uh, performing the authentication. So in this case, your authenticator will generate a passkey. Um, you're gonna send the public key to the application. Your application will issue a authentication challenge when you're ready to sign in. Um, that challenge will be run against your authenticator. Your authenticator will sign that challenge with the private key. Um, you send that sign challenge back to the application and the application will use the public key to um, verify that you were in possession of that authenticator. Um, so the possession part, again, is that something you have factor, so the actual physical authenticator. And this will be paired with some sort of pin or biometric to actually unlock the authenticator itself. So again, almost uh, similar to the same thing, uh, just applying this, um, these cryptographic principles to the authentication ceremony. So how it works, um, here we're gonna dive into what FIDO2 is, what WebAuthn is, what the CTAP2 specification are. Um, it, it can really be broken down by the chart over on your right-hand side. <laughs> um, so you have your client, which is gonna be your browser or your platform. Uh, so think your web application running on Chrome, your desktop application running on Linux, uh, whatever your client happens to be. That client is going to call out to your application, which is going to be the authenticating service and they are going to exchange um, some, um, some data in order to figure out which, um, which uh, passkey uh, should be provided to the service. That aspect is going to be the WebAuthn portion of it. So the WebAuthn thing is going to be what's going to facilitate the transaction between the authenticating service and the browser and the client platform. Now CTAP2 is the universal pro protocol to um, help each uh, platform talk to some sort of external authenticator. 
Again, when you have something a little bit more native, like a Windows Hello or a Touch ID, Face ID, that's not as necessary because the operating system knows how to essentially talk to itself. Uh, but in order to facilitate the ubiquitous use of any FIDO2 authenticator, um, especially in the case of external hardware like a security key, uh, you need some standard way to communicate with those devices, which is where CTAP2 comes in. Um, and because all of this is bound, so both the WebAuthn API and the CTAP2 protocol um, combined together actually create the FIDO2 standard. And it's because all of these are based on the FIDO2 standard um, that you're able to perform this sort of authentication, regardless of authenticator and regardless of service that you're using. Um, so it really is trying to democratize the different forms of um, authenticators that you can choose from. You're not bound to just what's on your device. You're not just bound to Yubico's hardware keys. You can use any sort of FIDO2 enabled device. Now, CTAP can be a whole beast in itself. Uh, so specifically for this presentation, we're going to be focused on the WebAuthn portion of things. Uh, so this is going to be that communication between your application, your identity provider, and your custom client application. So last but not least, I know I've touched on this a little bit, um, Ubiquitous FIDO2 uh, capable devices. And in case you didn't know, uh, the name Ubico actually comes from the word ubiquitous. So just a fun fact about the history of Ubico. Um, really, in the space of FIDO2 devices, we see things uh, separated into two buckets, device-bound passkeys and copyable passkeys, uh, both with their benefits, both with their drawbacks. Uh, both can be used as a FIDO2 authenticator, which is great. Um, so I'll actually start on the copyable passkey side of things. Um, and this is a relatively new thing by some of the big um, platform vendors, so your Microsofts, your Apples, your Googles. And this is essentially a way for your cloud account to sync passkeys across your different devices. Um, so I can create a passkey on my Chrome profile on my laptop and then use it on my Android phone later. I can um, create a passkey with Face ID on my iPhone, come over to my Mac and use the same passkey for Touch ID. Now, I know that doesn't sound as secure, but this is still more secure than passwords. So don't let that dissuade you from not wanting to go that approach. Um, these are still infinitely more secure than um, passwords. Now. This will depend on the protection of your actual cloud account. So if your iCloud account gets hacked, then they, the attacker would have access to all of your copyable passkeys, which is where device-bound passkeys come in. Now, device-bound passkeys mean that passkeys will never leave the actual authenticator. So in the case of the YubiKey, you create the passkey on here, and it will never leave the device. So you can have a high degree of assurance that whoever is authenticating is in possession of that authenticator. Um, so in the case of the um, Apple Keychain um, example, your iCloud accounts, accounts can either be protected by a username, password, and traditional 2FA, or you can enable something like advanced protection where that account can only be unlocked by a device-bound passkey. Um, so again, I know I'm showing two buckets right here, but they really do play together in um, this really nice way. So again, copyable passkeys, really good for the consumer use case for your Netflix account, maybe your Instagram account. Device-bound passkeys, really ideal for enterprise, regulatory, or high assurance use cases, so protecting your bank account or something like that. Um, so well, it always uh, depends on whichever one you want to use in your environments, but these are the, the general um, ways to think about these two buckets. OK, uh, we're going to go into the architecture of a passkey application. Um, now, this shouldn't surprise anybody. This is the standard way to architect an application from a very, very high level point of view. Maybe with the only thing adding the authenticator over there on the left-hand side. Uh, but what is important here is um, why we're here talking about this today. Because all of these components can either be a mixed match of things you buy off the shelf or open source technologies. So in the case of the example that we're showing today, um, it's a mix of different open source technologies that you can use. Uh, so the database that we're storing your actual pass keys, running MySQL. The application layer is using Spring Boot, which is also using one of Ubico's um, libraries for doing WebAuthn transactions. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And the identity provider is Keycloak, and the client's application is React because I am still stuck in the programming paradigms of about 10 years ago. So <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, and then again, also on the left-hand side, the authenticators. Um, again, this can be a mix of open source um, authenticators or something that you have either embedded in your platform or a security key that you buy from a vendor. So again, that mix match of different authenticators helps facilitate the entire architecture of the application. 
Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see something called the metadata repository. We won't go into that too much. Uh, really, the notion to take away from that is that your relying party, which is going to be your authenticating application, uh, can use external services to help validate um, the different pass keys that are being registered to your environment. So the relying party server and API. So what is a relying party? Um, I know this gets controversial when you talk to different people in different security areas. Uh, so just think of this in the web auth and um, specification sort of mindset. So in this case, a relying party is responsible for issuing and validating registration and authentication challenges. So this is going to be that thing that's going to issue things to your client application to say, hey, I want you to create this type of passkey, or I'm trying to authenticate this user. Can you find this other form of passkey for me? Um, and because this isn't just a transaction where you send a pass, username and password to, a, to your authenticating service, um, this is a multi-step process for both the registration and authentication ceremony, which we'll get to in just a moment. Um, so again, the relying party uh, sending the registration and authentication challenges to a client, these will be executed against the WebAuthn API, um, which we'll go into in even more detail when we start talking about the actual clients. Um, so your clients will uh, take that data, uh, pass it to the authenticator, the authenticator will do some magic, and then pass the results back to the relying party to validate whether the user um, should authenticate against the service. So making sure that they are in possession of that authenticator. Um, another nice thing about a relying party, and especially from the custom perspective, this can enforce different policy-based rules or decisions. Um, and that's really a big reason why we wanted to show that you can build one of these from scratch. Um, using a um, variety of different programming languages or, or SDKs. Sometimes things out of the box from like your Entras or your Octas might not um, provide all the functionality you need out of the box. Um, so this is what will enable you to build those different policies for your authenticating service. And last but not least, um, this one gets a little muddy, um, but keep in mind the purpose of the relying party is to manage your pass keys, not user information. Uh, you tend to want to marry both um, some sort of uh, identity provider like your Keycloak and some other uh, mechanism to do passkeys. Now, yes, I know Keycloak does passkeys out of the box as well, so this isn't always a uh, loose or fast rule. Um, you can mix and match them. It'll all depend on the service that you're using. But again, really showing that the power of passkeys is, is that you can democratize these things and you can separate duties as you need to, to have your own separate services. Um, so again, kind of touched on the identity provider. Um, again, this is really a concert between two different services. They can be a single service if you need to. Um, again, the reason why we're pulling our implementation of passkeys for our example outside of what Keycloak already supports is to just show the ability to do a variety of different things within your authenticating service. Um, so if whatever is already implemented in Keycloak works for you, great, go ahead and run and do that. Or you can um, use our example to learn how to craft your own authentication registration strategy. Uh, which you can get super deep into. Um, these are just the basics, but believe me, there are a lot of really interesting things you can do with the, um, with the different web authn requests. Um, Passkeys can still be used for OAuth, OIDC flows. Don't let this paradigm fool you into thinking that this is going to totally change how we're handling um, authentication flows. Um, you can still use some of the classic things. You can still use things like step up authentication and um, different policies like that. If you're, if you're even inclined, you can do passwords plus passkeys. I mean, that's also an option as well. So um, take a look at your use cases. Take a look at what your users are used to. See what others in the industry are doing. Um, question, yes? Why would someone There is no value. I'm just noting that you could do. <laughs> really, the ideal, the ideal flow is to just use passkeys because they already are that multi-factor authentication. Of course, you can do like IP um, location sort of validations on the user's clients and all that, but this is passkeys, not zero trust. Um, that can be a whole other conversation. Um, so again, I will repeat this one more time. RP application, store, manage, and validate everything having to do with passkeys. Um, the identity provider, store, manage the user profile and their state. It's an easy way to, to think of this. So we're gonna start with the registration flow. Um, so helping a user create a new passkey and register it to the relying party. Like I said, this is a multi-step process. This is no longer filling out a form and just sending it directly to your authenticating service. Um, there is a little song and dance that you need to do between the authenticator, the client, and the relying party. Um, so your clients will initialize some sort of registration ceremony. You're going to tell the authenticating service, hey, um, user XYZ wants to register a new passkey. 
um, for Lying Party says, cool, um, here are the different uh, data points um, to do this, and we'll go over those data points in just a moment. They're going to issue that uh, registration challenge to the client, and the client will broker that um, request to the different forms of authenticators. And for those of you who have uh, used passkeys, you might have noted that there's like different options that you can choose from. So you can either use your platform, your security key, you can do a weird QR code thing. Um, there's a variety of different options. Really the goal of the client is to broker that and just allow the user to choose um, the passkey that they want to register. Um, so the client will call out to the authenticator, it will pass the registration challenge um, and uh, uh, the authenticator will attempt to make a passkey. Sometimes this doesn't work because um, either the relying party sends a bad challenge, um, you're not using the correct domain, there's a variety of different things that can go wrong when talking between the client and the authenticator. Uh, but we're on the happy path. Um, so the authenticator will create the passkey and send the um, public key to the client. The client will take that public key and send it to the relying party and the relying party will indicate whether or not the uh, registration was uh, successful. And again, um, can be a pretty straightforward happy path, uh, but there are things that can occur on the relying party site that might prevent your authenticator from registering. Uh, for instance, you might have a policy where you only want uh, a specific sort of security key and you don't want copyable passkeys, and that might prevent some sort of registration. Um, but if you're a consumer use case and you're just allowing any sort of passkey, um, this happy path is fairly straightforward since uh, the clients will broker everything correctly if you're using a well-established mainstream browser. Um, if you're using a good SDK for your relying party actions, um, those things should format correctly. And if you're using a well-known mainstream authenticator, um, that should go smoothly. So this is all dependent on these different blocks um, working, but when they work, they work extremely well. Now we're gonna go over the authentication flow and surprise, surprise, it looks the exact same way. Um, really the ceremony is the same. Uh, client reaches out to the relying party for the um, authentication challenge. Uh, client gets that challenge back, passes it to the authenticator. Authenticator um, attempts to sign the challenge. That signed challenge gets sent back to the relying party. Um, and the relying party will let the client know whether or not the authentication uh, was successful. Now, yes, you can throw another line in there for the identity provider to broker that OIDC OAuth uh, flow. Um, but here we're just trying to keep it simple in terms of the example. Uh, just imagine the client is the identity provider at this point. Um, and again, really letting uh, the client know, okay, this user is allowed to do X, Y, Z, issue them their JWT token to allow them to um, perform actions against the application. And um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty straightforward, um, at least from a flow perspective. Um, so really when you're designing your client's application, which again, we'll go over in just a moment, uh, things look relatively straightforward. API endpoints, um, so always the fun thing. Uh, so your relying party is going to need a variety of different APIs to help facilitate these um, registration and auth ceremonies. Um, so you're going to have your um, registration endpoints to get your um, registration challenge and then to send that um, result to the relying party. Same thing with the authentication, again, facilitating that um, request and results sort of flow that I went over previously. And then of course, you're going to want to include some credential management APIs. Again, this is to help associate that user to their specific passkeys and help them manage those things. Um, so you would want a mechanism to allow a user to see all of their passkeys from their security screen. You want to give users a way to delete a specific passkey. And then last but not least, um, a way to edit their passkeys. Now, I'm going to throw a big thing with the edit passkeys thing. Never change the public key. Never allow a user to edit that specific material, don't allow them to change the user handle or the credential ID because that will break things. The puts uh, credential management API should only be used for metadata to help the user um, understand which passkey they're working with. So you'll see a passkey, you want to name it my first passkey, great, that helps the user understand um, which passkey they're using. Um, things like uh, when was the last time the passkey was used, another really good example for that as well. But again, never allow the user to change the public key or you will break things. And I will hear about it and I will laugh at you. Okay, so uh, API schemas. Um, so what I wanna do is uh, let's review the API docs together. Um, if you wanna go into some deep dives, and again, the presentation is available on the agenda um, to click these links. Uh, we have a whole documentation series about this. Uh, but let's actually um, look at these docs together. And I have a million screens up, so I apologize. Okay, so um, 
classic Swagger uh, documentation. Again, um, most of these are the methods that we uh, went over. Um, let's take a look at the um, attestation uh, methods. Again, these are the things that you need to do in order to create that user registration. And what this method will currently intake are a variety of different things that you can do with the web authent ceremony. So this is a way for the client to indicate to the relying party, hey, we want you to set these settings. Now, you don't always need to do this. Um, if you have a standard policy that you want the client to always enforce any of these options, you can remove all of this and only use the username and display name, um, and that would suffice. Um, and if not, um, if you want to allow the client to have some different options, um, you can change these as well. And I'll go over what these mean in just a moment. But what is going to be important is going to be this object that is re returned from the relying party, and this is the um, public key. So in terms of the web authentic specification, this is the public key credential create options, say that three times fast, um, which is going to be what is passed to the authenticator in order to create the actual pass key. Um, one of the main important things from here is this RP um, object right here, and this is what creates that phishing resistance. So this pass key will always be bound to this ID that you see right here. So whenever a user is trying to authenticate, that service should exist, at least from like a browser perspective, on login.example.com. Um, Chrome and all the other big browsers are really good about doing this. So if you are on login.example with a three instead of an E, because of someone's trying to fish you and steal your credentials, your passkey will not be usable by that domain. So the browsers will always, hopefully always know don't allow a passkey to be used in this context. Always look for a specific domain um, that the passkey was registered to. And oftentimes the authenticator itself won't even let you um, pull these things down as well. Also bounding the passkey to a user. So the ID is going to be your specific user ID uh, from your correlation in the relying party and passkeys. Um, the actual challenge itself uh, the web authentic specification notes that this should be a byte array, but um, sometimes it's a little bit cleaner to do the conversion from like base64 URL to a byte array. I won't get into that religious debate. Um, and what's going to be really important is going to be this authenticator selection uh, details right here. Um, and these are really the three primary ones that will allow you to do some different things during the web authentic registration ceremony. So resident key is super important. Um, for those of you who know FIDO from the before times. Um, resident key essentially allows your platform to discover that credential. So instead of a user having to provide some sort of a username to identify the credential on the authenticator, this allows the browser or the client to see, oh, I see this person has one account on netflix.com, so I'm going to allow them to authenticate automatically without providing that user ID, which is super great. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that all WebAuthn is all FIDO2 credentials are more secure than passwords, not all WebAuthn FIDO2 credentials are pass keys. This resident key uh, option needs to be either set to preferred, which will allow your client and your authenticator to determine um, if a resident key will be created. Um, you can change this to, um, oh, what's the other option? Um, man, this is embarrassing, I should know that one. Uh, there's a third option that will always enforce that resident key should be required. The option is required. Um, so that means that your relying party will reject this pass key if it is not a uh, resident key. And then there's um, one final option for um, not creating a resident key. And at that point, it's no longer a pass key. Again, you probably should allow it within your application, uh, but from the technical definition, it is no longer a pass key, but still a FIDO2 credential. Authenticator attachments. Um, if you're in the consumer space, I recommend you never set this. Um, there's two options for this cross-platform and platform. So platform will relate specifically to um, the authenticator built into the actual platform itself. So again, your Windows Hello, your Touch ID, your Face ID. If you set this to platform, this will always enforce that, um, that specific flow. If you set this to cross-platform, it will be um, a security key or this weird thing that's called hybrid, which is a QR code flow. Um, again, if you're in the consumer space, don't set this. Allow any sort of FIDO2 credential, because again, any sort of FIDO2 is better than no FIDO2, so don't exclude people, <laughs> especially security keys, but that's, <laughs> that's just us. <laughs> 
Um, now, if you're in a high assurance scenario where you want to prevent the use of copyable pass keys, this is where I will tell you to, um, to set this uh, to cross-platform just to have that little bit more assurance that whatever's being attempted to register against your application is the security keys that you're intending to register. And of course, there's other things that you can do in the back end of your lying party to determine, okay, this is the specific uh, security key that I'm looking for. And then last but not least, uh, user verification. Um, this is that uh, second factor that's, or that multi-factor that's built into the, um, into the passkey flow. So again, it's something you have, which is the device. User verification is that other aspect, which is either the um, something you are, so your biometric, or the something you know, which is your PIN. Um, from like a community perspective, we always uh, urge people to at least set this to preferred. Um, this will ensure that uh, users who have set a PIN or who have set a biometric will always be prompted. Again, it's just that extra bit of assurance that um, whoever is in possession of the authenticator is the person who owns the authenticator, giving you a higher degree of assurance that the person authenticating is the person who they say they are. Um, I would never, never really recommend to not set this. And again, for like higher assurance use cases, um, so your enterprise stuff, um, set this to required. Um, and then attestation, uh, recommend sending it to direct. Um, this is just a way to help your authenticator tell your relying party um, what authenticator you're using to make policy-based decisions. Um, and this is where that metadata repository that we saw a little bit earlier on helps um, how's the relying party determine um, which security keys are being registered against their account. So yeah, this is essentially uh, sent over to your authenticator uh, once it's sent by the relying party to the client. And once this is complete, we are going to call the attestation result. And um, this is gonna include a few different things. Um, what's gonna be important is this client data JSON and uh, attestation object. Um, these essentially make up your actual registration, so it'll include your credential ID, the user it's bound to, um, your sign challenge, um, things like that. And this is what will actually be registered against your relying party. And I will show you an example of this in the database in just a moment. You can send some uh, metadata back once the uh, credential is created. Again, you wanna let the clients know that um, this was successful. Um, so you can include things like the credential ID, um, if there's a nickname associated to it, um, time-based metadata. There's an icon, which I'll show you an example of in just a moment. Um, and state, uh, just to show that, hey, this passkey is, um, is still enabled for the user. Um, you might change this to disabled if the user decides to delete it, but you wanna retain something for historical purposes. This is fun, right, going over API specifications. <laughs> Okay, uh, search and options. Um, this is going to look a little bit easier than the previous one. So again, you're gonna call out to your relying party for um, an authentication challenge. Um, what's nice about passkeys is because they have that discoverable aspect which allow the platform to just discover um, passkeys that are specific to this specific domain. Um, you don't necessarily need to provide a lot about the user information. In fact, when you're doing a passkey-based authentication, you can actually remove this property right here or leave it empty, and this will allow for you to just look for passkeys on, um, on, uh, on the device. Now, this allow credentials, essentially what it does is it allows you to specify specific credentials that should be allowed for the specific user. Um, so this is more important in the case where your user has provided a username, sends that username to the relying party, and the relying party says, okay, I will look for passkeys or FIDO2 credentials X, Y, and Z. Um, and this allow credentials will help streamline some of that process. But again, for like a passkey consumer flow, um, you can remove this, it's not as necessary. It'll just add additional friction and removes that need to input a username, which um, again, we're trying to lower the friction for our users here. And again, RPID, super important because your passkey is bound to this domain, again, helping with the phishing resistance. This will help ensure that the relying party is expecting a passkey from this uh, from this domain, the clients will check that the user is on the domain, and then if both of those things are true, then uh, they'll pass the request over to the authenticator. And what the authenticator will do is uh, send some sort of a result back. Um, again, this is going to look very similar to what we just saw uh, um, with what was sent to the, um, the registration endpoints. Again, the client data JSON, authenticator data, uh, public key, and the user handle um, relating to the ID of the user who it belongs to. 
Um, I won't bore you with the rest of these uh, methods because uh, they're all pretty straightforward. Um, so get, um, we're gonna skip some of these. Uh, get user credentials. Again, it's just gonna give you a list of the user credentials. Delete, um, we're not gonna delete the user accounts, but we will delete um, a specific passkey, so passing the ID, or updating a passkey. Um, again, in this case, we're only allowing somebody to um, do something by a specific ID, and we're only allowing the user to change the, uh, the, user, the nickname of the passkey. Um, again, never edit the ID, never edit the user handle who it belongs to, never edit the public key. So yeah, uh, fun stuff. Again, if you wanna go into a deep dive with some of these things and some of the um, options and parameters that I'm sure I messed up, um, you can find that over here in the um, documentation series that we have on this. SDKs and libraries. Okay, so security, super complex topic. There's a lot of cryptography that has to go into this, a lot of reading of public keys and verifying private keys and yada, yada, yada. Um, I can barely spell SSH, so I definitely wouldn't try to do that on my own. If you want to, more power to you. Um, but I would overall recommend um, not to try to build this on your own, and instead using an open source example. Again, this is why we're here. Um, we're at the <laughs> Open Source Summit, uh, really trying to understand how to use these technologies. Um, there's a variety of different options out there to help with um, creating your relying party in all different sorts of languages. Um, ours is specifically in Java, um, but you'll find some in a variety of different languages. You can have your JavaScripts, your Rust, your Go's, your Pythons. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a PHP example in there somewhere. Um, so if you want the one that we're specifically uh, recommending because we built it, um, Java Web Authent Server will be your way to go. Um, but other libraries can be found um, on uh, passkeys.dev, which is a community resource that um, some people within the passkey community, FIDO2, Web Authent groups uh, help to maintain. Cool, so uh, we're gonna move on to uh, database storage. This one's gonna go relatively quickly. Um, the database schema can be extremely simple, and what is really powerful about the way you store passkeys is that it's only the public key. Um, so if somebody compromises this database of your registered passkeys, there's not really much they can do with that. They're not gonna be able to compromise other services. The most they'll be able to do is validate that you can log in on a website, which probably isn't much use to them. Um, so again, a lot of the onus on account protection is on the user to protect their authenticator and their uh, synced fabric accounts if that is what they are inclined to use or protecting their physical security key. Um, so one of the things you're gonna wanna store is your registration requests. This is going to help against replay attacks. Um, so if you issue a challenge to create a new passkey to a user, um, as soon as that uh, registration request has been used and consumed and a user has registered a passkey against it, invalidate it so that an attacker is no longer able to use that in order to create a new passkey for that user to gain access to their account. And this is going to be the same thing with an authentication request. Um, you don't wanna leave these things out there hanging. Again, as soon as this is consumed by the user, invalidate it and um, don't allow them to be used for any sort of passkey registration or authentication. Now, when we're looking at the actual registered passkeys themselves, um, the must have, so you need a way to correlate the passkey to a specific user ID. Um, you need the specific user handle. Now within the WebAuthn community, um, there is a difference between a user ID and the user handle. Essentially you want a way to correlate the user ID in your identity provider to a specific ID which acts as the user handle. Again, this is just to help with some of the privacy concerns to ensure that you're not able to trace passkeys across uh, user accounts um, if this database were uh, compromised. Uh, the credential ID um, just helps with filtering, um, but this credential ID also exists within the credential public key, um, which is the actual passkey itself, which is going to be validated. Um, now you can get away with just these four fields, uh, but some nice to haves um, offer the user the ability to change a authenticator's, um, your passkey's nickname, uh, specific authenticator metadata. Again, if you're able to determine that this person is using a YubiKey5 um, NFC, um, that's good to have as well and then time-based uh, fields such as date created or updated. Again, just to help with the general passkey hygiene. If somebody hasn't used a passkey in a while, let them know, and uh, they might wanna remove it if they no longer have access to that authenticator. Um, so let's take a look at uh, the SQL client super quick. Again, um, I'm not gonna go through everything here. 
Uh, but what is going to be important to look at here is the actual um, public key itself. Let's see, sweet, it did that pretty nice. Um, so here's the actual public key itself, the user handle, who it's associated to, and the credential ID. Um, and again, these are like the fields that I told you to, um, to have anyways. So if you really wanted to, you could just store this and be done with it. Uh, but I do recommend breaking out some of these columns to help with the um, searchability and your ability to query the database. Um, we can take a look at some of the attestation requests uh, here as well. And um, as you can see, both of these are inactive. So this means that I've consumed them both. Um, and I'll show you an example once we actually go through the client application where once I issue a challenge, uh, these will be active until I do something with it. Um, yeah, I know looking at SQL clients and databases isn't super exciting, but I just wanted to show how simple it is to store some of these in, a, in an environment. Um, and again, our example isn't production ready, so do not deploy the database <laughs> and use that as your production database. Put your database rules on top of that. Again, even though the risk of credential compromising is somewhat mitigated with a passkey storage database, uh, you still want to protect it because um, that's just good security hygiene. All right, the fun stuff, the client's application. So this is where I can actually show you how this thing works if you haven't uh, looked at it already. So like we went over before, the client application is what's brokering that connection between the relying party and the authenticator. This is more than likely your, um, your web application, your mobile application, desktop application, um, different things like that. Um, the client needs some sort of way to talk to the relying party, um, which is why a lot of this is extremely web-based. Um, yeah, you need to be able to call and get the registration and authentication challenges. Uh, the client should do some sort of validation on the inputs before it passes it to the authenticator. Again, most of this is already handled by a browser or um, like a, a native platform. Uh, but if you're building your own browser, if you're building your own um, implementation of this in like a specific Linux distro, just keep that in mind. Do some sanitation before you attempt to do something with the authenticator and you mess up the passkey creation or the assertion. And I have seen that recently with uh, Android, so just be careful with that. And um, one thing to keep in mind, your implementation will vary by ecosystem. The prompts that appear for Safari are gonna be very different from Chrome, or, which are gonna be very different from, uh, what's another fun one? Uh, Firefox. And even those prompts will look different between Windows and Mac and Linux. Um, so just keep in mind that this is going to look very different for each of your users. Um, and this is where some of the problems with passkey developments um, happen. So just always uh, keep in mind which platforms support passkeys. Most of the mainstream ones do anyways. So if you're in a consumer use case, that's great uh, because most of your users will be able to leverage passkeys. If you're in an enterprise environment, um, you'll need, a need to ensure that your users are using a specific version of the browser or your platform or um, operating system, whatever have you. And if you're ever confused about that, uh, we have two resources down there. Um, one of them on the Ubico developer websites. Um, so this is just general web auth and browser support. Um, again, just making sure specific features work for, um, for whatever ecosystem you're using. And again, I'll point you back to passkeys.dev, uh, which also has um, some resources on device support for uh, passkey ecosystems. So just double check this. Again, most of the mainstream platforms support these things now anyways, uh, but it's always good to double check. So creating and registering a new passkey. Um, so this is the front end React code. Um, what I like about this is that it's super simple. So the first thing you're gonna do is call out to the attestation options endpoints. We're just gonna imagine that get attestation options method is a fetch call over to, um, to your relying party. It's gonna grab those options. And what they're gonna do with those options is pass them into this navigator.credentials.create API. And this is that first step in the WebAuthn API. So the WebAuthn API is composed of two different methods, create, which is gonna facilitate that registration, and get, which is going to facilitate authentication. So in this case, we're trying to register a new passkey, so we're gonna tell the relying party, send us some um, attestation options. We're gonna grab that, pass it to this method, and if successful, we can grab that and pass it back to the relying party. Um, this request ID specifically relates to that um, request that we're storing in our database. Again, this is just to help ensure that um, the request that we're sending through will match to something we have in our database and we can check whether or not it's valid or invalid. And then even more simple, the UI element is a 
adjust the button, add a new passkey, call the method up there, and then your passkey will be created. And when we go through the demo, you'll actually see this in action. Now in an actual production implementation, this is a little bit bigger. You're gonna wanna throw some try catch statements in there, some error messaging, um, maybe some input validation. Um, but it really can be as simple as this, especially when you're first starting out in your passkey journey and you're just wanting to make sure that, hey, I understand how this stuff works. So registration, pretty straightforward. Um, authentication gets a little bit more complicated. Again, going back to the point that I made previously that every single browser operating system platform is going to present these prompts differently. Um, but across all of those things, there's two different paradigms where you can think about. There is the autofill and there is the button slash modal. So for those of you who have known about WebAuthn 502 for a while, you might actually be more familiar with the modal option. So this is as soon as that navigator.credentials.create method is called, that prompt appears, you select whichever authenticator you wanna use, and then you create your WebAuthn credential. Um, well, recently, and I say recently, like probably around two years ago, um, most of the major browsers operating systems introduced the notion of autofill. And autofill is super important for the beginning of our transition from passwords to pass keys, because this is something that users are familiar with. Um, now, the nice thing is that this autofill isn't actually sending over some sort of a password um, to the service. This is actually talking to the authenticator and passing that um, request over. So there's not that additional input. And even in this case, even though that login bar is there, you don't need to input the username because that's what autofill is already facilitating. Um, so again, the way I want you to think about this, uh, for this beginning phase as we're transitioning to pass keys, I would leverage the autofill just because your users are familiar with it. Um, but as more and more people begin to adopt pass keys, uh, begin to transition to that button only, um, it's cleaner, it's easier, you don't have to maintain a text box anymore. Um, and it might be a little bit less friction for your users who might still be used to typing in their username. Um, so we're gonna take a look at the modal flow just because it's a little bit more in line with what you saw with the registration request. Again, it's gonna be just as simple as adding a single button that says add a new passkey. Uh, very similar, you're gonna call out to the relying party. You're gonna get your assertion options, um, which is another way to say authentication. Um, you're gonna pull those options in. You're gonna pass that into the navigator.credentials.get which is the other WebAuthn API. Um, and then if successful, you're gonna pass the result back to the relying party um, to see whether or not the user was auth authenticated. Again, relatively straightforward method. Um, again, you're gonna wanna throw some try catches in here um, just to help users who may have done something unsuccessfully. Uh, but for the most part, again, for an evergreen implementation POC, this is essentially all you will need. Um, so let's go into uh, autofill. Um, now, I wrote some of this guidance, again, two years ago when autofill was first becoming a thing. I think most of the browsers and platforms have adopted it, but for those that might not, you still want to check if um, autofill is available. Um, so you can use this is conditional mediation available method. Uh, but if that method isn't available, you want to see if it's actually available within your browser. So one, make sure that um, you can determine the type of it as a function. If not, then autofill isn't available because it's not present in your browser. But if it is, call the method, see if it's been implemented with your browser. And if true, you can do that whole autofill transaction. And if not, stick to the button or allow somebody to input in their username. Um, this won't prevent anyone from doing anything. Uh, it's just a good way to make sure that you're not relying only on autofill for users who, um, who might not have it available to them because they're using an old version of whatever. So a little bit more involved than what we've uh, seen previously. Um, so you're going to have your text box here. Um, what's important here is this autocomplete username WebAuthn. Um, so this will just help the browser determine, okay, this is the, um, we're gonna allow autocomplete, but this is also a WebAuthn request. Um, on page load, you're gonna check that mediation is available. So again, going back to the method that you saw back here. And if it is available, then we're gonna kick off this method up here. Um, very similar, we're going to um, call out to the relying party to get the assertion options. Um, so the specific thing that you're going to use to authenticate. Now something changes with the web authentic call. Um, you're going to have your public key, which again is coming from your assertion options. Um, and again, this public key is the public key credential request options coming from the relying party. 
as defined by the web authent specification. And you're going to attach it with this um, thing called mediation conditional. So the other word for autofill within the web authent space is uh, conditional mediation. Um, then we flipped it around. Um, so pass this into your uh, navigator.credentials.gets method, and this will perform that, um, that autofill thing that you see over there on the, on the left-hand side. Um, and this is super nice because it runs at page load. So if your user does have an account, that's awesome. They can just click it and log in. And if not, then um, there's another little uh, box that appears, and um, they're able to use that as well. And um, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a bit. Okay, time check. I still have you all for 40 minutes. Great. <laughs> I promise it won't take that full time. I'll get you all to lunch quickly. Um, so yeah, let's uh, look at this together. Let's look at an actual client application. Um, so we've looked at some of these things. Um, I'm not going to bore you with key cloak um, configurations, um, but we'll go into the um, actual web client itself. Again, written in React because I'm back in the year 2013. And I already have it open. Sweet. So um, something super cool that you can do with uh, some of these browsers, um, you can actually um, create a virtual authenticator. And what this essentially does is you don't need to go out and buy a YubiKey. You don't need to create a credential on your, um, on your actual authenticator. You can simulate this so that you're not overburdened with some of these things. Um, so we're going to enable a virtual authenticator. Uh, we want it to support resident keys and user verification. We're going to add. Um, now, notice here we're on the sign-in screen. I'm going to refresh super quick. And what you will see when we actually go into our database is um, we have a number of these requests that are active. Um, so this means that I have not um, authenticated to any of these. But when I actually do perform some sort of authentication, um, this will change. But we'll look at that in just a moment because we are not going to um, Authenticate, we are going to register our first passkey. So again, this is an evergreen user. This is the first time I've been on this website and I want to create a new passkey. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter a username. Um, I'm going to go test two because I tested this right before the session with test one. Um, allow the site to see your security key. Sure. And we're going to create our profile. You're going to see like the OIDC dance happening with the URL at the top. Um, and here you are in your uh, user screen. Now, this isn't as exciting, um, so I'm going to actually show you this with, uh, with my actual YubiKey. Um, so I'm going to take this off. Because what I want you all to understand is that this is going to look the same regardless of how you're wanting to do this. So we're going to add a new passkey. Um, I'm going to click on my security key. I'm going to throw in my pin. Again, super simple. I'm going to do this again. I'm going to allow this site to see my security key. I'm going to allow. And because I was allowing the relying party and the client to pass some information about my YubiKey back, I was able to see uh, the little icon appear and the name automatically populated. Again, this goes into that metadata repository that we saw a little bit earlier on. Um, if you go into the actual documentation of this project, you'll see how that works. But it's kind of a more advanced use case, so I won't dwell too much on that. Um, and even if I'm inclined, I can do add a new pass key, and I'm going to just use my keychain. Well, let's see how this works. Sometimes it doesn't work great. Cool, and this appears. So one thing to keep in mind is that some of the platforms don't send um, that attestation data that allows you to determine um, which key is being registered. Um, this is because something like a face ID or touch ID is used on a sync fabric. Attestation is really good for determining that a credential came from a specific key, but if something is coming from a synced fabric, you can't always guarantee that it's coming from a specific device. So this is why something like Touch ID, Face ID, Windows Hello won't some, or Windows Hello does actually. Um, the Google Password Manager or like even like a 1Password might not include attestation data because you can't guarantee it's coming from a specific device. And one last use case to show, uh, we can update. I can change this to um, Touch ID. Again, this is just to help the user understand this is my Touch ID passkey in case you have these two that um, you can't really tell the difference between. And if I'm so inclined, I don't want this passkey to be available because I just deleted it. So I'm going to delete and only have these two uh, available here for me. Now, one other interesting, I can, interesting thing I can do, uh, let's add a new passkey and jump back to the database. So we're going to go into our attestation requests. And you'll see this one right here is still flipped to is active. So this means that the request that I just kicked off is still available in the database. So I'll be able to, um, to create a passkey for it. 
Um, our project doesn't do this, but essentially what I recommend is for there to be some sort of a timeout challenge. If 10 minutes have passed, invalidate that specific request uh, just to make sure that it's not continuously reusable by, by an attacker looking to register something against a, um, these specific uh, user accounts. Um, so I'm gonna cancel this out um, and it'll remain like that in the database. Um, but now let's move on to the other fun part of this and that's um, authentication. So one thing you'll see when I click into here, um, these are all old. <laughs> I can't get rid of these. I'll figure out how one day. Um, but we're gonna try to use this autofill to authenticate using my test two accounts. So we're gonna do that. Um, I can go with Touch ID um, because the platform has determined that that is available to me. Finding your profile. Boom, I'm authenticated. But that's not the only option you have. Um, I'm gonna log out again. Um, like I said, we can also do this directly from the button itself. So without ever clicking this up here, I'm gonna click sign in with a pass key. It's gonna give me all my different options. And this time, I'm gonna go with my security key. So I'm gonna click this. Two, three, two. And then authenticate it again. And to add even more uh, funness to this, I can come in here and I can type my username again as well. And um, I can click my key over here and it'll actually do the security key flow even though Touch ID was presented. And so that entering of the username is super powerful because it allows you to use non-discoverable FIDO credentials. So this essentially means that you can continue to authenticate using um, the non-discoverable credentials which aren't necessarily pass keys. I overall recommend you allow for both because our example shows you how to do both. Um, so you might as well allow that. Um, it's kind of a little bit more important for like a physical security key which might eventually run out of um, authenticator space. Um, but for the most part, you won't have that many pass keys anyways. So I'd recommend just supporting both um, non-discoverable and discoverable types. Um, but again, in order to say that your application supports pass keys, you have to support the discoverable aspect. So don't support non-discoverable and not support discoverable. Support them both. It's fairly straightforward. It's possible as you can see here. Um, and like I said, as you begin to transition um, across the journey, we're starting with this username box, uh, but eventually you'll move away to uh, removing this and only having the button itself, which will help make things a little bit more streamlined. Um, yeah, I mean, super, super straightforward demo. Um, if you actually go into the project itself, we released a new version of this where we have a um, mock bank account where it actually demonstrates the ability of pass keys within a real life consumer use case, which is super interesting. So hopefully they get invite me back next year and you all can see that <laughs> for part two of this session. Um, so yeah. Um, that really is the application itself. Um, resources, some super fun stuff. Uh, so again, if you're interested in this project, um, there's the link right there. Uh, the more stars on that project means I get to continue to buy groceries, so please go do that for me. Um, again, community resources, passkeys.dev, uh, maintained by the community. Um, I help out with some of that as well, so a um, bunch of really good people working on that. Um, there's another one called uh, Awesome Web Authn, another really good resource with even more than you've seen here. Um, so I recommend you go to that, um, learn a little bit about uh, what's available. Um, like I showed earlier in the uh, presentation, these are the technologies that helped build this application. Again, um, you, you have a variety of different options when you're trying to create these sorts of applications. And then one last shameless self-plug, um, check out the Ubico's developer program. We're continuously pushing things out like this. So developers.ubico.com and um, our GitHub is a Ubico Labs or slash Ubico for some of our more production ready applications. Uh, but yeah, thank you for sticking with me through this. I know this is a super complex topic. So again, use these resources to help you along your passkey implementation journey. Um, this really is a, a net positive for everybody involved. So the more services that adopt this, um, the more secure the web is going to be. So again, thank you all. And if there are any questions, um, I can go ahead and pass the microphone. Um, Yes. You had said that they're not usable across domains. Does that mean they're not usable across subdomains? So like if I have a passkey registered, for example, .com, would it be usable on 
mail.example.com, doc.example.com, and so on? Uh, so that's a really good question. And the answer is yes, you can use them across subdomains. But the more specific you get with the subdomain, the more restrictive it'll be. So if I have idp.passkey.com, and I set that as my RPID, then I won't be able to authenticate with passkey.com. So the less restrictive you are, the more you can use them across subdomains. Now, if you can guarantee that you will always authenticate users at idp.passkey.com, use that. But overall, I would just use like whatever the base domain of the application is. And the second question I have is, how is this really, does this relate to, or is it similar to X509, which is mutual TLS? It's a good question. So they kind of play hand in hand. So one of the nice things about the browsers is some of them will enforce that um, you're using HTTPS, uh, which helps ensure that secure communication between the channels. Um, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Not really, we can discuss further offline. Yeah, we'll do that, yeah. <laughs> hey, hi, thank you for the great presentation. I have a question about you. Know, you told a lot about the authentication flow, like uh, authorization and etc. Uh, what is there a maybe recommended or the best practice for restoring the access? So let's say I was banned by Apple, Google, whatever else. So I lost access to the keychain. So how to restore access? For example, in your example, it's not impossible. So it's not possible because there is no like even email store, yeah? Right, yep, and that's a really good question, and that actually has been a historical challenge for um, FIDO2 credentials across the board, which really is why that whole notion of copyable passkeys was introduced, because you can't always rely on, if I create a passkey on my, or a FIDO2 credential on my phone, if I break it, then I don't no longer have access to it. And this is why I talk about that marriage of both copyable and device non passkeys. So one thing to keep in mind is that passkeys introduced this notion of phishing resistant users. Um, so the more you can remove phishing resistant authentication from the user, the more secure they're going to be. What you don't want to do is have your um, recovery method be a password because then I'm not gonna compromise your passkey, I'm gonna compromise your password. Um, so this is why I recommend just having a variety of different options in terms of the um, FIDO2 credentials that you're creating. Um, so if you have your uh, like your sync fabric, like your, um, your Apple accounts secured with, um, that are securing your pass keys, um, have a device bound pass key also associated to that account so that you can continue to get back in. And like something that I've done like recently with the uh, PlayStation adoption of pass keys, I registered my one password, I registered my YubiKey, I registered one of my um, Android phones uh, to have that continuous access. So again, it's just more hygiene around how you're maintaining these accounts. Um, and just having a variety of different options um, that are available to you. I got a question. Totally just... Uh, All right, a uh, question just totally off the cuff. Um, love what you guys are doing here. I, I do a lot of talks about security and I've written software for years and years. I love what you guys are doing. One of the things, what you were just talking about really kind of just made me think about this. What about the concept of a primary token, primary YubiKey, primary something that I can travel around? I do a lot of traveling, talking at conferences, and, and if I lost my key, my bag, something, I'd, I'd be screwed in a lot of ways because maybe it's not copyable or, or other things. What about the concept of, since you guys are down into the weeds, having a master key that would just stay at home? that somebody could have and just say, hey, I want a master key that then would be allowed to make another key in the event of a, you know, I lost it type thing. Yeah. Thoughts? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. That scenario actually happened to me during Thanksgiving. I lost my keychain with my keys on the plane, which was a whole mess. Um, luckily, I also carry the second one. Now, I'm not gonna recommend everybody carry two Yubi keys with them, um, but you should. You should always buy two Yubi keys. Um, <laughs> hypnosis. Um, yeah, but I mean, uh, it kind of goes to the, the previous question around account recovery. Um, what do you do if you're locked out of one of these devices? And again, sometimes there's corporate policies that allow you some sort of admin who's hopefully phishing resistant to help you get back into your accounts. Um, but it's not always ideal in this sort of um, use case. 
So again, just always have some sort of fallback method that includes um, having like two sorts of passkey authenticators around you. Yep. Yeah. I was just thinking, especially for the older people that are out there, you mm -hmm. know, the grandparents, you know, they, they are very susceptible. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't tell you how many times my, my in-laws have clicked crap that they shouldn't <laughs> So anyway. <laughs> Um, do you have uh, some some kind of uh, template uh, or guideline? Um, if you have an existing application traditionally with username and password, how you kind of move people over to Passkey? Yeah, and uh, that's a really good question. Um, so currently, we don't have a great example. We might have some resources that discuss that within like the different Yubico um, like artifacts, like some of the blog posts and all of that but not from a technical perspective. Uh, we have talked about incorporating something like that into the Paskey workshop stuff that you just saw. So definitely really good feedback. I'll take that back to the team and see if we, we wanna build something like that. Uh, because more often than not, we're not gonna see these evergreen sort of implementations. It is going to be some migration between an existing identity provider then incorporating Paskeys into that flow. <laughs> 